Okay, thank you very much for joining us back inside after the coffee break, which I know was short, but I hope it was sweet as well. We are now going to come to our third focal topic. As Christian and I introduced at the beginning of the morning, we have three focal topics, three partner organizations. And last but not least, we are going to talk about feminist alliances across borders. So this session coming up now is going to look at local and global issues connected to gender, justice and injustice, women and LGBTI rights. The panelists will share their experiences and also focus on topic of collaboration between organizations, but also between individual activists. And moderating this panel, I would like to ask for a very warm welcome for the wonderful Sabina Mohammed from Mädchenmannschaft. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, and I would like uh, to ask my panelists uh, on the panel, which is Betty, Sheena, Kamale, and uh, Lala and Arevik, to join me in the panel. Okay, and before we start, before we start, I would like um, to ask you very kindly not to make any pictures of this panel because um, of reasons of privacy. Um, and um, yeah, there will be a live stream where you can also watch it, but I would really li like you to ask you not to make any pictures. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, welcome to our panel, panel on feminist alliances across borders. My name is Sabine Mohammed, and I'm very honored to be moderating this panel with, since I'm surrounded with very wonderful and strong and inspiring women who are doing outstanding work uh, in many fields regarding gender justice, feminism, uh, LGBTI rights, uh, women's rights, and its mediation also via media. And therefore, I would like to ask you to briefly introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Kamala, and that's a pseudonym. I am uh, from Bangkok, Thailand, and I am a um, researcher, writer, um, blogger, thought provocateur, um, and uh, I write and I ask questions um, on my blog and in my work and uh, on Twitter. Mm. Okay. Uh, my name, uh, not my name, but uh, her name is Arevik Martirasyan. She is an activist and researcher from Armenia. Uh, sociologist and I am Lala Aslikian. I am also an activist and uh, here I will translate for Arabic. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Elizabeth Gali and I live here in German and I'm an activist for women's rights or human rights. Um, uh, an activist for refugee uh, laws against uh, discrimination, refugee laws. Yeah, and I'm living here in German. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Sheena Magenya, and um, I work with and for um, here to represent Sister Namibia, which is a feminist women's rights organization that's based in uh, Vintuk, Namibia, which is down south. Um, even even in Africa, people don't know where Namibia is, so that's why I'm going into such <laughs> such detail. And it's not it's not even in a bad way. It's just it's very hidden down the. So yeah, I'm very happy to be here. I'm I'm a writer. I'm um, I did a degree in uh, media and psychology, but I stumbled upon activism. I, I like to think activism activism found me, and um, basically um, I'm a hellraiser. It's what I do, raise hell. Thank you. 
So today we will get an insight in their engagement and what it means when we what it means when we talk about feminist alliances across borders and and talk about current and local current local as well as global issues. And then I would like to ask you, Sheena, the give you the first questions. Um, what are the current uh, local threats um, regarding gender justice and sexual freedom in Namibia? Um, if when you think about um, the entire situation, the question should probably have been what are not threats to gender injustice in, um, in Namibia. But um, looking particularly in the context of Namibia, um, I try to categorize everything instead of just sitting here and listing everything into, um, into three things. Um, first is um, judicial issues and issues of governance. Now, um, post-independence, Namibia got its independence in 1990, and uh, post-independence, Namibia has made amazing strides around changing legislation to make it pro-women, um, and pro-women's rights, and pro-minorities um, and such. Um, and so, on a legal level, on paper, Namibia is actually compared to very many other African countries, it's a wonderful place to live. Uh, for instance, I can just list a few laws that were changed. Um, there's the Married People's Equality Act of 96. I don't think they have that in Uganda. There's the Affirmation Action Act of uh, 98. There's Combating of Rape Act of 2000. And there's even a Combating of Domestic Violence Act of um, 2003. And these are you know, legal instruments that specifically target or specifically benefit women, which are fantastic. But when you look at issues of governance, this isn't the lived realities of women in Namibia, where you find that even though the law says he cannot beat you, and this is statistically speaking um, where we know that women are the victims of largely up to 95% of the reports around gender-based violence are women reporting men who are the perpetrators, although I don't like those two terms anyway, um, perpetrators and victims of these crimes. So you find that um, largely women are the ones who will report this, but nothing is done. Um, even on a personal level, when I was in an abusive situation and I consistently, consistently reported it to the police, at one time they said, you know, we have actually bigger problems out there than this little domestic thing that you think is a big deal. And so this is, this is where the disconnect happens between the law is good, but the governance, the, 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 the stu structures in between, the law enforcement, um, the lawyers, access to these services is where this disconnect happens and then women can't live the realities that the law say they're entitled to. Number two is social cultural. This includes uh, traditional culture and popular culture, where cultures, culture, culture is not um, static, it's dynamic and it's changing. But also, for some reason, people hang on to really old, really archaic, really um, disturbing practices that they choose to see as their identity as Namibians or as traditional Namibian men and women who both experience and um, carry out these practices. And um, society is a, is a huge gatekeeper of this, where they decide what you can and cannot do as a woman. So whereas you're in an abusive relationship and you know what the legal steps are you should take, unfortunately you go tell your mother and your mother says you go back home. My, your father beat me, your grandfather beat your grandmother, that's it's what happens, suck it up go back home. And so you find women who do have maybe the education, they have the know-how, they have the ability to get help, cannot because society says they cannot and society acts as this gatekeeper that encourages this kind of violence to continue. And also this financial constraints. The truth is there isn't any money for women's work, for women's rights and women's activism. People don't think it's that big a deal. Um, you'll give somebody a ministerial portfolio and you th uh, or you'll give a woman a ministerial portfolio and you think that's enough. You have a woman minister. Why are you being greedy? What more do you want? You know, you're there. Or they'll, they'll do this kind of window dressing and where they think that, well, we've kind of solved that problem. You need to just go back down. Calm, calm the hell down, they just tell you, because what more do you want? So there's no money for women's work. And so you have to really scrounge and scavenge and beg and find money um, to do the kind of work that is required to get more justice accessible for women. Thank you, Sheena. Um, I wondered when you were talking about um, the current threats uh, 
in uh, Namibia that you are facing actually also with your work, um, how the situation is regarding um, your work, Arabic, um, and if you could enhance on that a little bit, and I think you also have uh, prepared something for us, and maybe we can also try to find if there are connections regarding historical uh, evidences, etc. Yeah, the uh, the situation is uh, quite close to Namibia, and uh, all the c categories were well, that you were mentioned can uh, can be found uh, almost everywhere. Like in in Armenia, the laws exist, although we do not have still the domestic violence uh, the law on the domestic violence. But anyway, some laws are exist. Everything is there, but the society itself, like told, stop to uh, close the gates, and so everything depends on uh, so society. And uh, Armenia at large is the patriarchal society and that's why for our work and uh, fem for feminist uh, for feminist activities is very important to trace the reasons because we have the history of Soviet Union like uh, when we have these uh, socialist uh, ideas especially in 20s uh, on ideological level for example we want to show you uh, like how to it is there. Like uh, we can show you the posters from Soviet Union, especially where the, those posters were uh, prepared. Were prepared uh, during Soviet Union or during 20s and 30s, and where those ideas of uh, women, liberation of women were very, uh, were very uh, widespread. For example, here, woman uh, is screaming books. Which means about which is t talking like uh, the woman uh, uh, liberation through the knowledge should go. Uh, we also have here the uh, woman, uh, the very famous uh, expression from Soviet Union that each and every kid, uh, each and ev mm, ev every uh, woman uh, should uh, uh, know how to govern the uh, state. Like it is very famous one, and it was uh, this slogan. It was very much used, and uh, here is so uh, here is uh, telling that slavery, uh, the kitchen slavery, should be removed, and this woman is trying to go out of the kitchen. The new, uh, the new, see, uh, to create a new situation in the house and outside of the house, and the woman should be sport, a sport woman, of course, like so. Uh, and uh, here you you have like you can see those posters which are very nice, which uh, which uh, like for me it is I, I like those posters very much. But the problem with this is uh, is that they are vertical, like they are imposed and they are uh, they were the parts of the ideology. So not the people themselves like made those posters, for example, like right? but mostly uh, it is by the state. And so throughout the Soviet Union. Union, we have that uh, liberation, uh, that liberation from the um, Soviet Union. Uh, 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 we have that, uh, how to say, the tendency. But in reality, we have another picture. And uh, after the Soviet, uh, the collapse of Soviet Union in 90s, in mm -hmm. we have. Yeah. We have already another another situation when the uh, women started to work in the trade, and uh, like Armenia was engaged only in the trade, and this uh, this was the only way of uh, income generation. And uh, here, women started to work, but men uh, only were like we are telling that only uh, to uh, count money. And uh, what we, but now we do not have any women oligarchs because afterwards, afterwards, these roles from the uh, of trade woman from the uh, was regained like by men. So, uh, yeah, the status is uh, remained uh, remained the uh, same. Like uh, the man is governing woman, although she made all the black work, all the difficult work. But anyway, it remained. Uh, like uh, 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 women remained on the same place. And uh, so, 
Yeah, and so the woman remained exploited during this time. And now the situation like is very um, like very common for any patriarchal society because we have stereotypes about women, like uh, all those sexist stereotypes, like women is a, a, machine, a machine for the uh, reproduction. It's a, so, so you know about. I, I don't want to go more about describing how patriarchal. Uh, what is the image of woman in patriarchal society? And uh, so uh, we. Uh, so now we are trying to come from this vertical uh, thing. Like uh, we, I told that this, for example, this image of woman was very vertical and was imposed by the uh, ideology of the state. We are trying to come to the uh, uh, horizontal thing and to smash, to break down that vertical and go to the horizontal things. And so what uh, this is what we are governing in our work of the uh, while organizing some feminist actions. And the second one is that we are trying not only to make uh, women from uh, the image of woman uh, to present not just object but uh, subject but not only subject but the subject uh, um, which is um, constantly breaking the stereotypes if uh, you know what i mean like i, I mean that uh, we mean that uh, this is the uh, the image of woman which is constant, uh, constantly breaking down its uh, her own uh, stereotypes and that's why we are trying to make more uh, not we are trying to do not propaganda but art we are focusing on more on in our actions on non professionalism we are uh, try we are telling we are telling not to lo logos we are mostly deconstructing the real deconstructing the reality and deconstructing ourselves like for example in our like e when we are working in when we are doing our actions, for example, trafarets, uh, graffitis in the streets, we are street art, yeah, we are making that in the corners, like the first beginning of any motto with, which we are doing, we are doing that in the corner. Uh, that's why we are trying, uh, that's we are trying to, how to say, to break down what we are doing already by doing that act of performance of a, or any performance we are doing in the streets we are uh, doing that very open and again we are directing that to the deconstructing to bringing the to breaking all those stereotypes mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and also, uh, and also, like uh, we are uh, focusing very much on own, on creation, and on the um, continuation of own media. Because whatever we are doing, whatever image we are uh, doing, like it is um, trans uh, how to distorted by the patriarchal media, whether oppositional or governmental. That's why we are focusing very much in our feminist some things, uh, some actions, or even man uh, reading manifestos or etc. on the uh, own media. Maybe we go back. We will uh, go yeah. back to that. I think in the second round to uh, on your work. Thank you for your insight. Um, Carmela, when you hear these uh, things, um, what is going through your mind or how do you interconnect them and what are the most pressing, pressing issues uh, in a global context, also connecting it to uh, the situation in Thailand? Um, first of all, I can say that, of course, there are a lot of similarities uh, uh, in terms of the socio-cultural you know, aspect, the values that uh, resist change. Um, even with more women coming into, you know, the workplace and being uh, outside of the home. Um, in Thailand, uh, Thailand prides itself of having the highest percentage of female CEOs in the world, higher than any European countries in America, 49%. But of course, it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, as you would expect. Um, in the bureaucracy, um, we have only 17% uh, 
of uh, women represented in parliament and three to four percent in the local administration. So that doesn't come close to the minimum 30 percent or 49 percent. So there is a lot of uh, uh, the, this quite a difference in the private sector and the public sector uh, for the lives of women in Thailand. Um, in terms of rape, uh, in terms of se uh, sexual violence, domestic violence, that is a big problem uh, in Thailand as well. Although um, we do have quite uh, progressive uh, rape, anti-rape law uh, in 2007, the rape law has uh, changed, and uh, rape now is defined as all forms of penetration of anybody against anybody. You know, a male against male, and and, and a female against male, and, and spousal rape is illegal. Still, the same problem of en of enforcement that is underlined by the old attitudes that resist change. Um, the, a lot of domestic violence, a lot of rapes are still not reported because the police don't take it seriously. Now, um, um, I'm asked about the global context. Um, of course, there are all kinds of problems, and 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 uh, Thai women are at the end of you know uh, uh, lots of injustices. But I would like to focus on one aspect of um, of the cross-cultural. Uh, um, uh, how, how do I frame it? The, the cross-cultural uh, phenomenon. Now we have globalized uh, um, uh, world where, as you know, I'm sure Thailand is known as a uh, main tourist destination in Asia. When you think of Thailand, you think all kinds of things, you know, sex, of course pretty women and sex and you know temples and sex and so um now but uh, of course we have a lot of you know white men and young and old and older uh coming to our country and um, we also have lots of women coming uh to thailand and um now just uh let's let me give you an example of uh, this cross-cultural uh, situation. It's, it's kind of a clash of culture. Now you see more uh, because um, because of the internet, because of the the internet connectivity. Uh, you can go to the next. Actually, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Just keep it there. And and actually, I would like to have the video first. So I, uh, let me give you the signal. Okay. Um, the some months ago, last year, late last year, there was a situation of a rape of a young Dutch model uh, in Krabi, which is a very famous uh, destination, uh, tourist destination in Thailand. Now, um, she was raped, she was beaten and left on the side of the road and was found in the morning. And by villagers, she was taken to the hospital. And um, later on, we found that the rapist was a tour guide and um, it was um, it was a big thing the 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 father of the um, of the survivor the rape survivor made a video um, and I would like you to show you the video it's called evil man from Krabi <laughs> Um, is this something no, no, where we no. would have a trigger warning to it, or like? No, 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 no. Okay. Just, okay. There's no rapes, you know, anything. It's a music video made by the father of the, of the uh, rape survivor. Yeah, please. And this no, was this was done targeting the Thai audience. <laughs> ชายคนดังกล่าวหลบหนีและถูกพบหลังจากเกิดเหตุการณ์นั้นหนีเดือนเขาถูกจับกลุ่มได้แต่ได้รับการประกันตัวออกมาและปฏิเสธทุกข้
Okay. So uh, that video got um, half a million hit. Um, and what brought it on was that um, the Thai, the reaction of Thai officials uh, to to this case, um, the the police first of all, and then later on the a minister, a tourism minister, uh, who said she it might not have been raped uh, because she had dinner with the alleged rapist. Uh, so that, of course, um, was outrageous for the father, uh, for the pretty much uh, everyone, and um, that there was, you know, when you have a case of uh, of rape in the Thai media and especially uh, the official line, particularly if it involves uh, foreigners, you know, if it might affect tourism. There's always a denial uh, first. It's a, a knee-jerk reaction. Now, um, there was another case of, uh, can we go back to uh, the PowerPoint, maybe the third? Um, there was another case of a rape um, early this year of, a, of, a, um, of the Scottish student. Now, what happened? She, she said that um, she woke up, you know, she went out uh, at night to a bar in the south of Thailand, and she woke up and she felt that she was raped by three or four men. She couldn't remember because she was drunk. Now, the reaction again uh, uh, from the Thai officials and the media was that she was drunk. This is, was a drunk, it was a drunk a Western tourist woman. And in all, you know, reports, always starting with a drunk woman, as if if you're drunk, then you you, you can be raped. And and then um, a, a man was arrested, and then he said that no, no, it was consensual. Uh, you know, I tried to have sex with her three or four times, but you know, I couldn't because she was too drunk, and I succeeded once. Uh, so that wasn't rape. Um, so that was. Uh, you know, the, this shows the, the, the underlying attitudes of, of, of uh, the, the official lines and the conservative, uh, especially the police, you know, the police, military and the officials are always the, 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 the last stranglehold of uh, conservatism in the country. My point is that the, um, the, um, this is a report, this is a green screen capture of a report by the Thai newspaper online. They showed a student ID of the woman who was raped. It's actually not pixelated, it was clear. Everybody could see her face, her full name, what university she was going to, and then, you know, I was among the people who were, of course, outraged. You know, how could you do this? You know, she was raped, and you just can't put her picture up. And and um, that is to say that, of course, we have, uh, you know, in this kind of situations, uh, in um, the online culture, you always have the official uh, level of reaction, and then you have a more popular level of reaction the online is and the Thai people were outraged too. You know, they were upset and they, we posted uh, the protest on the website, said you can't do this. It's just not professional, it's not acceptable. So they took it down. And um, the same thing with, uh, uh, with the rape uh, video. There were lots of uh, comments from Thai people saying that we are, you know, the, the reactions of the of officials are a disgrace. You know, it's, it, it, it's embarrassed us so much more than, you know, uh, the bad things that happened. And um, um, so I, I wrote um, about this story and uh, the, actually um, I wrote about the, the, for, the, the Dutch tourist rape and uh, um, that was to show that um, particularly to the, a Western audience to the outsider to understand that 
you know, the, the news that are reported on the traditional media, the Bank of Post and the Nation report, you know, just what the official says, but not so much other people, but there, there are more nuances in, in, the, uh, in, in the differences in, in the reaction. And uh, so in a way to, to help the, the outsider understand the, the Thai uh, cultural context better. Thanks. Thank you for your insight and also um, uh, regarding uh, rape culture also um, being very present in uh, Thailand, which is probably not only, not, yeah, but th like how to deal with rape and uh, how it, it, it is deal dealt with in a patriarchal society, which is, uh, which is a global phenomena. And, um, I would like to make a shortcut because we will come back to this issue again and um, ask uh, Betty um, what the current um, local uh, threats um, are uh, for women in exile and challenges and how you actually found it and who, what women in exile is and how you came up with this really important uh, and yeah, necessary project. Um, first, uh, maybe I would like to say that uh, when um, I'm an, I came as an asylum seeker in this country, and um, when someone comes here as an asylum seeker, they think, uh, okay, now I'm in a safe place, I'm in a place where there's democracy, I'm in a place where I can do a lot of things maybe further my education, have a good job, and all those, <clears throat> those things. But when someone uh, gets in, is uh, you know, the reality is different. You find yourself uh, accommodated in a collective place, uh, homes, they are called collective homes, and you find yourself there with a lot of people from different um, backgrounds, and then you find a lot of your um, human rights uh, have been denied, regardless of your thinking that uh, you have them now. For example, you are not supposed to move from your district where you have been placed, or you know, then you have a lot of racist controls by the police, in the, especially for the black people. It's not, it's not a secret. The police will just control you in the, anywhere, in the trains or, um, in the, you know, anywhere. And then you find you cannot even work, maybe after some time after staying here for so long. So most people lose their perspectives and uh, then you just have, you don't know what to do next. So you decide either to fight against these uh, discriminative laws and uh, that's what a group of us decided to do. And um, we decided to bring these things into the open because we found out that most, uh, People in the society didn't even know what was happening to the asylum seekers who are living in the homes, the, in, the, in these collective homes, they are called homes. <laughs> and you find that the, the people just, they ignore the fact that there are people living there, they are comfortable, they are getting food, they are getting a, a place to sleep. And that's what the life of a refugee is all about. But to us, it's not just like that. I mean, we have to empower ourselves. We have to have our human rights recognized. And we formed a group of, and we started fighting, fighting these laws 10 years ago. And before that, we had joined together with the men. And after some time, we found out that there are more placing women uh, issues which were placing women than the men. We found that uh, women are double victims of these laws and other things which goes on in the homes. For example, if there are sh families or women with children and um, they, they don't have privacy, first of all, you are placed in a small room for like four people, a family is placed in, a, uh, it's in one small room, so there's no privacy. The children cannot even do their homeworks or, you know, and uh, 
a lot of also sexual harassment and also the the people who land these homes they sort of uh, harass and threaten also the women there because uh, they sort of hold some powers which they feel they can you know it's always the power to the uh, i mean to to the oppressed that okay you should do this or you sh you can't have these you know those type of things they are the things we started um uh, fighting against and that's why we formed the women group and uh, it was to fight these laws from uh, a woman's perspective so we fight these discriminative laws and then fight them from a woman's perspective that uh, we bring them out we make campaigns we make demonstrations we are all doing uh, for unitary work, and uh, it's difficult to keep the work going, but uh, we try to to move on. Thank you. Kamala, I wonder if you see parallels when you um, heard what Betty was talking about women in exile and being oppressed and um, regarding sexual abuse when you think about uh, migrant domestic workers uh, in Thailand? Yes, um, I think the, the refugees, um, foreign migrant workers uh, in lots of countries including Thailand tend probably tend to be probably at the bottom rung of society they are worse off than the poorest people in that country and uh, in um, lots of countries in Thailand included uh, it is very difficult to bring their plight to uh, uh, to the awareness of the public because of lots of uh, um, uh, problems uh, mainly xenophobia, racism, it's also a class issue. Um, there was a, a, a case in Thailand of a, a young girl, 12 years old, um, who was kidnapped by a Thai couple and who was held as a slave, basically, a real slave. She was tortured. She, she had hot water poured over her whole body, uh, so her skin melted. Uh, she escaped once when she was nine years old, two years after the captivity. The police sent her back to the couple. And uh, then three years later, a cat got out. She was so afraid of being punished by the, the couple. She climbed over the fence, finally realized, oh, actually, I can run away too. Hopefully, and would not run into the police this time. So basically, it was the cat who, who helped her, and, and she was finally rescued. And uh, so the question arises, uh, so lots, lots of questions arises. How? I mean, this was a seven-year-old kid who was held captive, who was uh, working in a, a dog grooming shop. And this kid, when she was punished, she was put in a dog cage, made to eat dog food, had hot water poured over her. Now, it was done by, uh, she was tortured by both the man and the woman. So uh, uh, this uh, is just one case among many. There are other people like her. Often they are teenagers or even kids under 10 years old who are abused and tortured in this way. And lots of times the society doesn't get to hear about a case like this because it's not reported. And if they would be beaten inside a home, nobody would talk about it. They would talk about it after like they've been beaten to the point where they have to be hospitalized, got cracked or you know, uh, there was another case after this one, like a girl basically became blind and, uh, you know, uh, all, the, the, all, all kinds of uh, things that went wrong uh, in her body uh, after several years of abuse. Now, I think this, um, I, I would like to, to point just uh, one important aspect in this is that women are not only the victims 
of uh, violence like this, they can also be perpetra perpetrator. And what do we do? Uh, and why, you know, um, a woman who is maybe the matron of the house or the wife, why would they treat, you know, other uh, women or girls like this? Why? Perhaps at the same time, they are also suffering the kind of oppression that they're putting on uh, the other people uh, in a lower status than they are. Thank you, Camilla. Um, Gina, I would like to ask you, because since we were talking uh, also about um, having rights or not having rights and being uh, victimized and surviving regarding uh, sexual violence, um, how do you, like, what is power? Like, how do you frame power so that we make sure that w what we are talking about and um, how is this process with Sister Namibia? Um, this is a discussion we have practically every lunchtime. Lunchtime is when um, we all sit, this is literally every day, we all sit around, we have a resource center around our table in the resource center with our lunch. Um, that's also when our director tries to get me to eat meat. Anyway, I digress. Um, and that's when we have these discussions and d discuss and um, argue and agree to disagree. But a topic that always comes up is power and what it is, because it seems that a lot of um, the issues that divide women and men or um, parents and children, these things that create these social dichotomies are around power and who has power and what is power. Because it seems that if you are in a heterosexual relationship and um, the woman's the breadwinner and you bring home, home uh, the bacon, um, then it is seen by society that this man has lost his power. And therefore he will be ridiculed, um, they will consider it emasculation they will say that you're no longer a man. They will, uh, so to speak, say that you um, don't have any balls. You know, they say that. Um, and it brings us to discuss what is power, because it seems that it's that th that thing, that element, it's this intangible element of um, that's been presented as something that, of control, of um, subjugation, and a lot of it is presented as power over. People never try and present power as something that is shared. I have been very lucky to work in an organization that has never had a horizontal or a hierarchical construction of power. Everybody's opinion matters as much as the next person's, where it's not a top-down situation where you're always told what to do, how to do it, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these are, these are discussions I think we need to have more of um, in society. We need to deconstruct power. What is power? Who has power? Can power be shared? How can power be shared in a way that doesn't disrespect or take, um, violate the human rights of somebody else? And I feel that once people try and reevaluate and re, um, redefine what power is from early on, because this 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 kind of understanding of power starts very early, where in um, traditional, not even traditional, just in general, many African societies, um, you learn from a young age not to challenge people older than you, not to question, um, not to report that as a child you need to know your place, as a child you don't have a voice, as a child you're just a child, you're not a person, you're not visible, you don't exist until you're around 13 and somebody wants to marry you, then they see you if you're a girl or if you're a boy when you're at an age where you, you're sent off um, to study or you're sent off to the fields or something, that's when people start to acknowledge you as a person. And this is something that stays with you and this kind of control um, like um, Kwemala was saying, is is what makes you wonder why would a woman who herself probably has been um, a victim or has experienced you know gross amounts of um, violence, why would she be the perpetrator in a similar situation? But the truth is that hurt people hurt people. If you're you know a hurt person, if you're a person who's only experienced pain, you look for that opportunity to oppress other people because that's the only way you understand to have power or what power is. Power with you is not something that is shared, it's not something that's a positive construct. Um, but these are discussions more people need to have and a lot of the times are seen as completely out of the box. People think you're loopy. 
when you talk about things in that kind of framework, but it's important to deconstruct power. Okay, so deconstructing power, um, what does it mean in reality? Like, um, uh, in order to deconstruct it and also to have a say um, in some um, societal uh, movements or to change laws or to have an impact, like with whom do you work together? And I would like to ask Betty first and then I would uh, like to give you the question because I think you have also a nice companion you could short, sharp, shortly uh, talk about very sharp. Thank you. Um, mostly we are working with people who are having the same goals as us those who are fighting uh, the refugee discrimination laws. And, um, you know, those which are against uh, women and children emancipation. And um, we are working also closely with, uh, like we had earlier, that uh, when you are just an organized group, you need the, the non-governmental organizations to get you some funds to do this or that. So we cooperate with the Fruitlings Blood, Blood and Book. And we have also a lot of feminist women here in Berlin, especially who are supporting us, um, who are helping us. We need a lot of, uh, we don't have the language to write documents and all that. <clears throat> so we have uh, them helping us to write documents or translations to organize our campaigns. We are also doing a lot of uh, peer education, so to educate the women on their rights. So uh, those are the people we are really cooperating with or who are we working with together. And uh, at the moment, we are running a campaign where we are asking that children and women and children should be moved from the collective forms and these collective forms should be abolished. So um, mostly we are working with groups who are who have the same aims, like us. Maybe very sharp, so then we can. Okay. Um, so as far as um, collaborative efforts or collective action goes, in um, 1999, uh, Sister Namibia, along with easily 40 other civil society, community-based, non-governmental organizations, formed what was then called um, the Namibian Women's Manifesto Network. Now, uh, Sister Namibia, which was steering this um, initiative, realized that for real change to happen, Sister Namibia in 1989 started off as a magazine, as a, just a women's magazine, and has evolved over the years. And by 1998, they realized, which was building up to the 2004 um, elections, general elections, Sister Namibia realized and that political involvement is also very important. So what Sister Namibia did is, um, along with a host of other organizations, formed the Namibia Women's Manifesto Network. What they then did is, for five years, collaboratively working together at the most basic, most literally grassroots, literally grass, grass, not, not I, they went to the villages and under trees, under, you know, in the field, spoke with women and told women, look, if you want things to change for you, you have to have political representation. You have to have women who go out there, women who can understand um, the political systems or women who are willing to push for change for women in Namibia. And this, um, they got more women elected in the local councils and the regional councils, and this led to um, a sharp increase. At, at that time, pol um, parliamentary representation of women in Namibia was at 12 percent. And this, by at the end of the 2004 elections, it was up to 30 percent, which was the highest it had ever been. Um, then in two, th you know, in 2009, it went back down. Because, uh, hold the applause. Uh, but it, which, which for us is proof that it has to. It's consistent work. It, it's not something you do. Then you sit back on your laurels and you're like, ah, it's done. No, it needs constant working on. But it showed that together, and this was something that people were very happy to collaborate on. And and 
I guess sister was taken aback and like, wow, everybody wanted to join in. Um, sister Namibia formed what they called the Namibia Women's Manifesto. Uh, they launched it. They sent it out to all these different NGOs and said, well, would you like to sign on it? Would you like to work with us? Everybody said, yes, that's fantastic. Um, in 2009, sister Namibia initiated what we called then because it was called it was called the 5050 manifesto at the time so we decided let's do the 5050 in the bedroom manifesto around sexual rights no nobody wanted to be part of that people were like uh, i don't know because of course we're going to be talking about abortion of course we're going to be talking about um lesbian rights lgbti rights and you know all of a sudden that's a problem like yeah the other 50 50 we liked this one we don't know we're not so sure so it has its it has its spikes and it's you know its crests and its falls but it is possible when i guess you have something that people agree with, which isn't often, but when you do have something that people agree with, even as a feminist organization, it's possible to mobilize in a very large scale that leads to like huge change. Sorry. I have one more question, one last question, but thank you for uh, your insight. <laughs> Very short. Um, because I would like to ask you to, since you have been talking about collaborative work, right? Yeah, you work in a group and you have been working as individuals regarding LGBTI rights and um, how this work is going for you. And maybe, Kamala, you can also say a word to it and then we might open it for one or two questions and then we can finish it. Thank you. We both, uh, we both are working uh, like individuals and all voluntary basis without any organizational and uh, all that stuff. And I want uh, very much to connect to the issues which we were talking uh, uh, and we were thinking like uh, there also in the morning sessions about proactive and reactive and creating institutions, strengthening some regulations or vice versa, uh, smashing and breaking down the, all those stuff. And I wanted to very much to tell that, but I was afraid that my English will not be enough for that but anyway I want to say that that it is just the uh, uh, two parts of the logic uh, it is just two logics two types of the logic and the matter is which one you choose like for us we are choosing the second one of course and uh, trying to work out to raise the questions to bring uh, all our issues uh, by break uh, by deconstructing again these words by deconstructing the reality and ourselves and through art uh, this is the way we are choosing the work I don't we don't say that the institutions are not important uh, all that stuff is not important it is important but the matter is which one we are choosing and uh, why we are choosing that in Armenia from our perspective of course it is like uh, because of our personalities but also is that we see that women should be represented on public sp public spaces and when we will translate from Armenia, uh, like to be a citizen, it is like a civiliza civilization of any action you are doing and uh, doing this in the public sphere. So we are trying to create this sentiment of the city, to create this um, atmosphere which can change people, which can change our minds and the people people minds also. So that's why we are working more like we are uh, we are feminists, uh, feminists, we are more working on uh, human rights protections like uh, all those issues, but also it is some so sort of experiments also. It is some sort of creating the reality. Like it is more, it is more about that. And uh, the, during lunch, lunch we were talking a lot and uh, we were talking most also about like of, of women organizations and individuals, how they are collaborating. And uh, almost everybody agreed that uh, in their countries uh, exists this problem that women organization trying to keep the infrastructure and trying not to go more into these feminist issues because feminism it is something like bad thing. It is like labeling everybody would say, oh, okay, this feminist and uh, do not something bad which is coming from Europe and which is tr uh, strengthen uh, which is threatening our society and so this uh, the same thing we had uh, that's why we are trying to work more on the um, breaking out the stereotypes and uh, the taboos and doing that through art uh, i'll try to be very brief um in the capacity of a 
researcher who does a lot of work at the policy level uh, and uh, kind of a troublemaker, questioner, thought provocateur. Um, so I um, try to ask questions. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Thailand has the first female prime minister in history last year. And uh, she was called, forgive my language, a whore many times. No feminist ever came out. There was a uh, red shirt uh, protester who was gang raped by soldier during the protest. No feminist came out. Transgender uh, women or trans women uh, raped in prison because in Thailand, transgender people don't have legal identity. So male to female, transgender is still mister. So when they are arrested, if often for solicitation, uh, you know, a sex worker, they're put in male jail, then they're raped. No feminist came out to say anything. Uh, tomboy, lesbian, you know, masculine, lesbian are raped. Most often corrective rape. Nobody says anything. So um, I do research uh, in, on this topic. And at the same time, I question and write things and under my pseudonym. And in a way, they kind of come together. I'm trying to get different groups. I work with different LGBT groups. For the first time, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the first uh, discrimination uh, research in Thailand against LGBTI. So uh, hopefully something will come out of that, and I will just keep prod and poke the Thai feminists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Also, we have ja auch erst um 10 nach. Uh, we started 10 minutes after. Pass now. We pa yeah. So I would like just one or two questions, and then um, we will finish it. So just to. Okay, um, is there one, so we can take two? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to be very bad now, but um, if there are very pressing questions in the room, I really invite you to grab the ladies right away when they come from stage. And I'm taking the, all the, I know, but it's a quarter past now, and we had exactly one hour for the panel. It wasn't, a, I'm really, really sorry about this, but I need to just check that we're going to finish the whole conference on time. We have one more session to go. I think you all did a really fantastic job on this panel, and I really, really hope that you take the opportunity to speak to the ladies in the rest of the time that we have during the session. I don't want to upset anybody by doing this. I'm, I'm just doing my job. As I, okay, like I said, you can blame me personally. Please give a really big round of applause.